NCAA 2K20 on GA Sports is brought to you by Derek's NCAA 2020-2021 rosters. These are the most authentic college basketball rosters ever produced, featuring true-to-life player faces, ratings, and tendencies, as well as fully customized teams, coaches, and lineups. Check out the Patreon featured in the description so you can get the roster when it drops, plus monthly updates. Come be a part of the most ambitious project in sports gaming by clicking the link in the description. Welcome to the NCAA 2K20 Final Rankings Show. Now, this is not the tournament selection show. That will come next episode. But this is us ranking every single team in the NCAA 2K series from 36 to 1. So you can see where every team ended up, at least in our minds. And if you disagree, let us know in the comments. Obviously, I mean, we always talk about stuff in the comments. So let's start with the bottom 10 teams from number 26 to number 36. And, I mean, we have to start with uh, the unfortunate winner of the, I don't know, the Toilet Bowl Award, whatever you want to call it. I feel bad. But Mississippi State from the SEC finishing at 2-12. and 12. Just a disappointing season for a team that does have some individual talent. Yeah, absolutely. That's hugely disappointing for them. I mean, like I was telling you, I mean, we, we picked the best 36 teams, you know, that we thought would make this interesting, that would make this fun, you know, with, yep, with yep. some that were fan fav favorites, maybe some that in real life we enjoy watching and whatnot. But, you know, Mississippi State would not go 2-12 in, in real life. You know, I don't think they did go 2-12 in real life. Life. So, they did not. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're sitting here looking at a top 36 team, team in our mind out of all 200 in the NCAA that yep. just unfortunately is being put to shame in what we've done. But yeah, <laughs> Mississippi State coming up against a tough SEC conference. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll ultimately see how many of those teams get into the tournament. But you know what? Like, that's, yeah, it's crazy. So unfortunately on them you know condolences there for uh, any bulldog <laughs> fans out there but and <laughs> yeah, not much more to be said really yep yep absolutely the other team that 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 we wanted to talk about here uh coming in at number 31 is the virginia cavaliers out of the acc finishing with a final record of 5 and 11 and the reason that we wanted to talk about this is virginia in the last rankings that we saw came in at number 15 that was that was the rankings right before conference season began they have dropped 16 spots to number 31 that's the biggest drop that we've ever seen in the ncaa 2k rankings why was conference season so difficult for virginia i mean look they're playing in the acc and there is you know one undoubtedly best team in the acc and that's being duke mm -hmm. and then you have other teams such as north carolina you have, you know, the streaky but also very talented Florida State team. You also have, you know, Louisville as well, which has been a really good basketball program in the past few years. And, you know, you, you just have some of those teams there. So it, it, it's hard to be really, really good. Like, if you're going to make out of the ACC, you have to be the cream of the crop. And unfortunately, Virginia just didn't meet those standards. Yep, yep, unfortunately that is right. But I am glad that you brought up, I mean, these are the 36 best teams in the nation, at least in our mind. Um, and so, you know, finishing at number 31, this is a Virginia team that is obviously incredibly talented, very, very good basketball team. So uh, we don't mean any disrespect to uh, what, Virginia, what Virginia has done. Let's move on to the teams that have just missed out on the all-important top 15, numbers 16 through 25. And what I first want to highlight real fast is this block of Pac-12 teams here, number 22, 23, and 24, Oregon, Washington, and Arizona. These are all teams that at different times have challenged for an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. All of them ended up falling short, and I really think that that's just an illustration of what the Pac-12 is like, where all these teams finish with similar records, and it's because, frankly, they just all beat each other. And so, you know, it, it's tough to stand out in the Pac-12 conference. You're absolutely right about that. When a lot of these teams go one and one against each other, it really just comes down to that non-conference schedule, which actually I think is what really helped UCLA, you know, propel them out of there. Other than having the best record in in the Pac-12, but you know, having a really good out of conference, they were battle tested. I think when they went to the Pac-12, then they were, would be disappointed. So, yeah, these these are all teams, you know, which Washington, for example, was a team that was in the our, I think our top eight at one point. Um, 
and they've they've dropped massively since the start of the season. So yeah. that just goes to show how tough this conference is. Um, you know, condolences to uh, Arizona and uh, Nico Mannion, the freshman sensation. <laughs> you know, I think if if the, if his team would have done a little bit better, he might have gotten a little bit more spotlight. But you know, he, he played he played like a solid freshman would, and then Oregon as well. Definitely one of those teams that had potential. I would say kind of like Virginia. You know had the potential to, to actually make it to that top 16, make it for a tournament run, but just they fell fell victim of just a really good Pac-12 conference. Yep, yep, you are really absolutely even, right. Even Pac-12 conference, I should say. Yes, yeah, very well balanced. And uh, to your point, Washington's highest ranking was indeed number eight. That was in our first rankings episode that we did. It feels like a long time ago now, and, and it's going to feel like an either, even longer time for the Huskies. Let's talk about the two teams here that we know have automatically qualified for the NCAA tournament, Syracuse, and then obviously the Michigan State Spartans just missing out on the top 15. But these two teams, I mean, they they ended a little bit lower on the rankings, and yet they're going to the NCAA tournament. What was the deciding factor here to keep them out of the top 15? I think what the committee was looking for was, you know, you know, how many wins and how many quality wins do you have? You know, Syrac- Syracuse just be, you know, as we said before, they're in that tough ACC uh, conference how um, we talked about with Virginia, you know, and they beat a lot of those teams there, but it was kind of like, it was kind of like a what have you done for me scenario with Syracuse, mm-hmm. you know, and Syracuse, I mean, they finished second in a conference where they got blown out by 54 or some points by Duke in one of their games. I think it was at the at, at the Carrier Dome, to be honest. I so believe it was. When you're when you're coming second in a conference like that, you know, kind of downplays it a little bit, which is why Syracuse fell in the rankings. Um, I would say Michigan State got as high as they did in the rankings, you know, over over an even, you know, Colorado State, even record Colorado State team because of the surge they had, because, you know, they played in the conference that had Purdue in two, and still did as well as they did. You know, you're, you're saying that they their only two losses came to Purdue there. Well, shoot, they um, won every other game aside from that, I believe. So, I think I gotta look this up. I think they have one other loss. Yeah, they lost to Michigan or Minnesota. Sorry, and, they oh, lost to Minnesota. Yeah, and that and was lose, yeah. that was their first game. That was their first game in conference. Then they go on and lose to Purdue in double overtime, and then they just rattle off seven or six straight wins after that. So, uh, Mm -hmm. for seven straight. So, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, Michigan State, they're there mostly because of their 0-6 record non-con. They started 0-8, but the turnaround that they've made, what they've done, we know that they have the toughest schedule in the country. We've known about that since the non-conference schedule began. Uh, you, You have to respect the turnaround that Michigan State has had to get them into this position. Let's yep, move on. Abs- absolutely. Yep. Let's move on to the top 15, and we'll go one by one here, starting off just making their way into the rankings at 10 and 8, the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Yeah, absolutely. They had, you know, a super solid season in conference. Obviously, they missed out on that second um, place finish there, but, you know, they had a strong enough non conference season to, you know, propel them into that top 15 here. Mm hmm. At number 14 coming in from the Big 12, the Kansas Jayhawks. We know they are NCAA tournament bound, but uh, they just they, they didn't finish their, their season as strongly as they would have wanted. They didn't win that conference, losing to their in-state rival Kansas State in the final episode. Yeah, and you know what they did? The, the reason I think their record's looking a little, a little soft here is because they didn't play as many non-conference games as I'm sure they would have liked. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they came into the conference season, I think they lost Azubuki for three games. He had he had a, a thumb injury, if I remember correctly. He had some sort of injury that held him out for three games. I think they actually lost all three of those games. And so I think that's kind of what's put them where they are. They're still a really good team. They still did really well in the conference. I just think that based on that, that little stretch, they had a little rough patch there. That's where it's put them at 14. 
Yep, I think you're right. At number 13 from the non-Power 5, and you'll see this several more times in the rankings, uh, the Villanova Wildcats finishing with a final record of 9-8, and eight, falling off a little bit from where they were before conference play began when they were 6-1 and one, and their only loss was to Memphis, but still a strong showing for Villanova who will absolutely factor into the committee's decisions when it comes to the selection show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, don't want to go too far with too much more into them, but um, yeah, the reason they had that drop off was that really tough non-Power 5 conference where we kind of just mashed a bunch of teams together that we thought would be fun to have have <laughs> in this, and you know what? It became one of the powerhouse conferences, so. <laughs> yep. I, so what you're saying is we were right about the teams that we decided to put we, in there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Fair enough. In at number 12 from the SEC, the Auburn Tigers, another team that has just missed out on automatically qualifying for the NCAA tournament, but a 10-6 and record, a strong showing from Auburn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they dro they've dropped a few places from when they were 5-1, and one, but again, you know, it's the same about a lot of these teams that have dropped kind of uh, from, from our last rankings to these rankings, you know, it's just that conference play. That is why conference play is so tough is because you have to do good against the teams you see two times in the season in our case. So um, yep. still hats off to Auburn for making it in the top 15. Yep, well put. Now just missing out on the top 10, the UCLA Bruins out of the Pac-12. The Bruins will be kicking themselves here. Their only two losses in conference have come to their bitter rivals, USC. And while they have had a very strong showing in the Pac-12, they still will finish below USC in these rankings. Final record of 11-7, and seven, but I feel like UCLA could still be dangerous come tournament time. UCLA has a lot of weapons there, and you know, if your two losses are to USC, who was a team that was mild, or I would, yeah, I would say mildly inconsistent, um, I think you're, as long as you don't come up against them, I think you're looking good if you're a UCLA Bruin fan. Fair enough. Starting with the top 10, the North Carolina Tar Heels out of the ACC finishing 10-6. and six. They are not automatically qualified for the NCAA tournament, so they will have to wait to see if they grab one of those four at-large bids. For North Carolina, it all went wrong at the beginning of their conference season, and they were just able to turn things around to get into these rankings where they are. But if you're North Carolina, are you nervous about potentially not making the tournament? Uh, yes and yes and no. I would be I would be slightly concerned, but you are playing in that AC, ACC conference. You do have some big wins against some big teams as well. So I feel like strength of schedule will really help North Carolina out here. In at number nine, the Kentucky Wildcats out of the SEC. Kentucky is another one of those teams that uh, has been inconsistent throughout their conference slate, but with the help of EJ Montgomery, if you want to see where EJ Montgomery finished in the player of the year discussion, go back and watch our last episode uh, where we unveiled all of the individual awards. EJ Montgomery helped the Wildcats to a 12 and seven record. Kentucky is going to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, Kentucky faltered a little bit late here, um, but they have kind of always hovered around this this area here in our standing. So um, excited to see what can come from them in the tournament. No doubt. In at number eight, the USC Trojans out of the Pac-12. We mentioned them before, finishing at 10 and seven. And for USC, what it all came down to was two wins over UCLA, two wins when it mattered most in prime time, when all the eyes were on them. So I, I hate to say this as a UCLA fan, but congratulations to USC. They're going to the NCAA tournament. How dangerous can they be uh, come tournament time? Yeah, absolutely. A name that wasn't touched on a lot throughout the season or in our award show, but uh, Rakosevich, the big center there, he was a driving force through the Pac-12 conference for the USC Trojans here. So look for big performances from him in the NCAA tournament if USC is going to go any further in that. At number seven, Kansas State out of the Big 12. They are the winners of the Big 12 Conference. And this is a team that we have not given enough love to given how well they have played. For anyone out there who may not be very familiar with Kansas State, I think they are going to be dangerous in the tournament. What should people watch for when they see Kansas State come the big dance? Oh my gosh, what should they watch for? It's a balanced <laughs> team. <laughs> it's a balanced, they're a fun team. They're a little, little young, 
Um, so they're, I think they have a little bit of inexperience, but to get to where they are, they know how to play on the big stage. It's just going to be now when in these one-off games, who's who's going to be the the bigger player? You know, who's going to be the bigger team? Can these Wildcats stick together? Yep, yep. At number six, this is going to be a controversial one. The Texas Tech Red Raiders out of the Big 12 didn't finish first, didn't finish second. They finished third in that conference, and yet they rank above Kansas State and Kansas. Adam, how can you possibly justify putting Texas Tech here? <laughs> well, you know, you look at their record here, 14-5. and five. They were huge, huge in non-conference play, you know. And you're telling me that they have five losses. They still have less losses than Kansas State, than KU. You know, two, two of the bigger boys, the, the first and second teams in their own conference. These Red Raiders are dangerous is all I'm going to say. I think don't look too far past them not finishing in the top two spots in that conference. Um, but look forward to a big tournament from them. Fair enough. We move into the top five now, and it's your boys out of the SEC, the Florida Gators. They won that conference. They came on really strong towards the end of the season with wins over Kentucky, just to name uh, just to name one big team that they have beaten. Florida finishing at 13 and five. This is a team once again we don't we haven't talked very much about, but they are for real, and they are they are deep, and they have talent in every position on the floor. Absolutely. On their day, they they can be one of the best shooting teams in the country. I think next to Texas Tech, I would put there with them. Um, and obviously Duke as well. But yeah, Florida Gators, something sneaky about them. You know, I'm always, you know, sly optimistic about my own team here. But the committee <laughs> says that they've done well enough to be fifth, fifth best team at the end of the season. So we'll only see where that takes them. Fair enough, fair enough. At number four, the Memphis Tigers, former number one team in the country. I don't want to say they limped into the finish, but uh, they certainly looked like uh, they had some weaknesses towards the end, losing two of their final three games, one against Houston, and then, of course, in the final game of NCAA 2K20, losing to Seton Hall. So they end up finishing second in the non-Power 5 conference, but this is still a Memphis team that is young, they are hungry, they are athletic, they sport... Well, according to us, the second best center in the country, that being James Weissman, and the best freshman in the country, this team, we've said it before and we'll say it again, this is as dangerous a team as you can get when it comes to the NCAA tournament. Absolutely, and I think it's really harsh for them to fall to number four, but that last game against Seton Hall kind of put in the nail in the coffin for them a little bit and drop them a few spots in the rankings. But you know what? Memphis is still an ounce or an insanely talented team, as we've talked about, as their players have gotten recognized for. So look for them to do big things in the tournament. I think you're right about that. Number three, the Purdue Boilermakers out of the Big Ten, finishing at 15-3, and three, led by, spoiler alert, the player of the year, Matt Harms. This team, I mean, we started talking about them towards the end. But how good can this team be as they join Duke as the only two teams to go undefeated in conference play? Well, when you have a 7-3 center who's the player of the year, you know, that's virtually unstoppable. You don't know many guys on these teams that are 7-3, to <laughs> say the least. So um, when you have someone like that who's kind of the do-it-all man for Purdue here, you know, there's no, there's no surprise that they are, you know, third place or third ranked in our standings here and are looking to do big things in this tournament as kind of a dark horse team. No doubt, no doubt. Now just edging out the Boilermakers are the winners of the non-Power 5 conference, the Seton Hall Pirates, finishing at 16-2. and two. There is a razor, razor's edge between these two teams, between Seton Hall and Purdue, yet Purdue finishes with a better record in conference. Why did Seton Hall jump them in the final rankings? I, oh my gosh, uh, it, like you said, razor thin. It's just, I think it's just because they played in that non-Power 5 conference, you know, and there, it, it's hard to say that conference bias played a part of this, but I think you look at Seton Hall, you know, Purdue's biggest win was not against Memphis Tigers like Seton Hall's mm -hmm. was, and I think that's what really put Seton Hall uh, above Purdue there. I, I, I think between two through four, you could put these teams in any order, you know, and you know, people, you can debate it any which way, but just the way our committee put it, I think that win over Memphis really solidified Seton Hall's place there at second. 
Yep, makes a lot of sense to me. And if you do want to debate it, head down to the comments. Let's talk about it. But, of course, there is no debating who is the number one team in the country. The Duke Blue Devils, winners of the ACC, 17-0. and I guess, I mean, I've asked you about how dangerous teams can be. I've asked you about why teams finish where they are. But let me ask you a different question here for Duke. Is there any way that the Duke Blue Devils do not win the NCAA tournament when it's all said and done, given how great they've been this year? That is a tough question to ask, and I think that all depends on which side of the bracket the Memphis Tigers land on. You know, they do have two losses. Seton Hall and Duke do play similar styles, so it's not past the Blue Devils, in my opinion, to beat Memphis, but I think Memphis, with James Wiseman, it will be their toughest test. Um, if they do come and face each other, if they are on the same side of the bracket. Other than that, I think Duke is such a solid team. They're such a great team this season, led by Trey Jones. I, I can't really see them faltering unless, you know, something crazy happens, unless a team plays a perfect game, per se. Well, we know that that is apt to happen in the NCAA tournament. And, uh, man, you've gotten me excited for some of these matchups that we will see come tournament time. Well, you won't have to wait very long to find out what those matchups might be. Next episode, we will have the NCAA 2K20 selection show. We will find out who has made the NCAA tournament, and we will find out what dream matchups we could be seeing. And then, of course, after that... It's all about playing the games, and you'll get to see every single one of them. So subscribe so you can see every game from the NCAA tournament. We appreciate you.